Welcome to Libraries Today. This program is intended to recognize and highlight the unexpected ways local libraries serve their communities today. I'm your host, Stan Howe. 2016 was a year for comebacks. This program came back with a new name and a new look, and several West Virginia libraries had to come back from devastating flood damage, and we chronicled that on Libraries Today. In 2016, we also tried to highlight the varied programs and services provided by public libraries in the state, and we visited libraries in Kanawha, Cabell, Wood, Greenbrier, and Nicholas Counties. We took a close look at kids' reading programs, services for teenagers, new technologies, and some old, still useful technology in library bookmobiles. Let's take a look back at libraries today in 2016. Probably the most impactful event in 2016 were the floods of June, which hammered four of our public libraries in Kanawha, Greenbrier, and Clay Counties. The Raynell Public Library was hit very hard. The Clay County Library suffered some significant damage as well. And the Elk Valley Public Library has been closed since the flooding because its access bridge was washed away. But no library suffered more damage than the Clendenin Public Library in Kanawha County. Here's what it looked like just weeks after the flood. We're here in Clendenin, West Virginia, standing in front of the city's public library. Powerful floodwaters forced out windows, left eight inches of mud throughout the building. No printed pieces of material, books, magazines were left unscathed. Tables and chairs floated across the room and computer equipment was destroyed. The electrical and HVAC systems were damaged beyond repair and the structure of the library itself is uncertain. Nothing in the building is considered salvageable. And now it's up to the Kanawha County Public Library System to decide what comes next. Let's take a look inside. I'm here with the facility manager of the Kanawha County Library System, Tim Venisanos. Tim, uh, why don't you tell us about the damage that we're seeing here in the library? Okay. This area over here was the children's area. And of course, this we had nine, almost nine and a half feet of water in here. Nine and a half feet, that's, that's amazing. And when we came in the back door to check it, we had DVDs and books in the ceiling and the drop ceiling. Mm -hmm. Of course, you see the original ceiling now, all the, uh, right. the old ceiling is gone. This was the children's area over here. We had the, um, all the computers over here on the wall for the children. This was the circ desk area, the checkout. We had the workroom over here for the staff and the branch manager's office was back here. Over in this big area was most of the library stacks and the books. We had the teen zone was over in this area here by the window, which was completely washed out. Yeah, that's completely gone and this one is... And this one's about half gone. Yeah. How long did it take you to, to clean all this up? It took them about three weeks to completely get it to this state that we see right now. They came in and they took all the drywall out, all the ceiling, the ceiling tile, doors, um, all the equipment, the books, the stacks, yeah. carpet, tile, everything had to go. It was a complete loss. How many people were employed here, do you know offhand? I think there was five or six of them that was uh, here that were affected. Mm. So Let's what see. was in this, this back area? That we had a meeting, a little um, study room right here in the corner. It was very nice. And in this area back here, we had our meeting room. This was just a big closet here. We had a kitchen area over here. This was our meeting room. We had just put a new 55 inch TV on the wall over here <laughs> and a sound bar. Mm. Of course, all the electronics, everything was affected. It was a complete loss. Yeah, I can pick out the bathroom. Yep. And back here was our furnace room and all of our equipment, which got damaged. All, uh, the, all your electrical? Yeah, all the furnaces were up here. We had three furnaces. 
Uh, outside, all the uh, air conditioning condensers were removed. Um, we'll have to completely replace the uh, they want all, anything that electric that was consumed with water, they want to see it replaced. So it will all have to be replaced, all the lighting, HVAC, duct work, everything. So it's very devastating. Were you, how quickly did you get here to survey the damage? Well, after as soon the as the water went down, uh, we were in here on, on the Saturday after that. And we came up and... They were just letting people in at that time because the water had receded. That's your first experience with a uh, with a flood, with a big flood like yeah. this. Yes, um, in 1997 they had a flood up here, and there was only three feet of water that got in here. So they came That's in. That's still devastating enough. Yes, yeah, it was a, a lot of work. We were down for a long time, and uh, but this time it. There was nothing to clean up. I mean, it was the whole building had to be torn down. I mean, not torn down, but everything in here had to go. There was nothing in this building that we could save. Tim, I appreciate uh, you showing us around. It's it is uh, it's heartbreaking, really. It is. It really is. And not just for us, but the whole community up here. The fate of the Clendenin Public Library is still far from certain, and libraries today will revisit this library and the other flood-damaged libraries for an update in 2017. Libraries in the 21st century offer a wide variety of new technologies, spearheaded by high-speed internet service with free Wi-Fi, digital services, and much more. But even now, there is still room for at least one old-fashioned service that still makes its way down West Virginia country roads, the bookmobile. Today's bookmobiles enjoy cutting edge technology, but still rely on bringing the library to the patrons. On Libraries Today in 2016, we paid a visit to a bookmobile in Raleigh County. We're here at Shady Spring Elementary School, one of the stops for the Raleigh County Public Library's bookmobile service. And with me now is the head of operations for the bookmobile program, Amy Smith. Amy, thanks for uh, dropping by and letting us spend some time with you. Uh, that's not a problem at all. We're glad to do it. Okay. First, give us a little background on the bookmobile service. When did things start? Well, as it's been told to me, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, there became a pursuit of cultural and intellectual enhancement both in Great Britain and in the United States. Uh, I think the, from what I've been told, the first bookmobile hit the streets in about 1904. Those started in both Virginia, South Carolina, as well as Maryland. Um, in this area, they began talks about it in 1924, and by the year 1936, we had our first bookmobile, which was actually shared between Raleigh County and Fayette County, and we've been running ever since. So this is our, I'm proud to say, 80th anniversary with the Raleigh County Bookmobile. That's great. Now, right now we're standing behind, in front of actually, your, your biggest bookmobile, but you actually have what, two units? Yes, sir, we do. One was purchased in 2010, and that would be this, our bigger bookmobile. And we purchased uh, the smaller bookmobile in 2013 with the help of the USDA and uh, several other grants and donations. Well, this is a good-looking bookmobile. Let's go Thank take you. a look inside. Sure. So, Amy, now we're inside a good sized bookmobile and I'm looking around at, at your collection here how does that work does the bookmobile have its own collection of, of books or does it share it with the main library sometimes we borrow some of the books from the main library but we actually have our own budget and our own collection development um, we, we keep our collection in an office that's outside of the bookma bays where we store both of the buses uh, and we normally try to refresh the collection on both buses pretty frequently to make sure that the books that we have are new, uh, that are not damaged, um, that are trending and things like that. We try to keep it updated. How big is the collection? Um, actually, our collection is a little bit over about 22,000. 
Um, this bus will hold about 25,000 items and our smaller bus usually holds anywhere from 15 to about 1,700 items. So if 2,500 in, in this bookmobile, 15 to 1,700 in the other, so mm -hmm. obviously you, you really do have to spend a lot of time and moving books back and forth. Yes, we, we spend an, an awful lot of time. Usually at the end of the day, um, any areas on the bus, any shelves that might have um, been quite gone through, we always try to make sure that we replenish those at the end of the day. Uh, we generally order books out of our budget once to, to twice a month and we try to make sure that those new books are put onto the buses and available as quickly as possible. How big a challenge is it to manage the inventory uh, in a bookmobile. I noticed while we were uh, uh, a little earlier watching the, the kids coming in and out yes. and the, here at Shady Spring you have a, a lot of classes coming in, kids coming in picking out books. Mm -hmm. I, is it a tough task to manage the inventory? Um, it can be. We, we're usually pretty busy. We're normally on the road um, all but about two days out of each month. We use those days as administrative days and that's usually when we try to get uh, the largest amount of work done that we can as far as um, checking the books on the bus to make sure that none are in need of repair, uh, things of that nature. So it, we have a very limited amount of time to, to do a whole lot of work with our collection. So how often do you make a stop like here at Shady Spring? Once a week? Um, actually, five days a week we're at five the schools. Both buses are normally running five days a week with the exception of two days that we use as administrative and bus repair. Okay, then describe the process for me. So uh, a youngster comes in, picks mm -hmm. out a book. Uh, how do you, what's the process to get the book back returned once, once uh, the students done with it? Um, normally the teachers are pretty good about uh, letting the children know a couple of days in advance when the bookmobile will be back. Um, so when they come on the bus, we use our own Wi-Fi system um, through a hotspot that's made available that we run both computer systems off of. When the children come on, they'll bring their old book back, give it to uh, the driver. He checks that in. We help them find a new book and we check it out for them here. Um, the teachers are given slips of paper on every visit that makes them aware of the next date of our return. And as I said, they're, they're very good about letting the students know a couple of days in advance when their books will be needed um, to be returned. Amy, this is a great program. And thanks for spending Thank time you. with us today. Oh, no problem at all. I appreciate it. Come back anytime. Bookmobiles still bring library service to regions of West Virginia that would otherwise not be served. And for rural areas of the state, continue to be an essential part of library service. We'll look back at more of libraries today in 2016 after this. Welcome to Understood.org, a free online resource for parents of kids with learning and attention issues with personalized recommendations, tools, and daily access to experts to help your child thrive. Understood.org, because understanding is everything. We are looking back at libraries today in 2016. Thanks for being with us. One of the many things that libraries in West Virginia do exceptionally well are programs for kids, teens, and young adults. Nearly every library in the state focuses their programming on these categories. And one of those is the Kanawha County Public Library. In the Libraries Today debut show, we visited with teen librarian Michelle Ross. Welcome to the Kanawha County Public Library on Capitol Street here in Charleston. Today we're going to pay a visit to the Teen Zone and learn about the resources available to both teens and young adults. Let's take a look inside. So here we have our Zone 4 Circulation Desk. We also have DVDs, audiobooks, and music for teens and adults. And now we're going to take a look at the teen-specific collection. So here we have graphic novels and manga for teenagers, and we also have all of our teen books here. Um, these titles are selected specifically for ages 12 through 18. So here in the lounge we have nice, comfortable seating. We have study booths for individuals to study at or in pairs of two. Then we also have a nice large big screen TV where we can do gaming or stream anime and films. And then to our left, 
we have a computer area. These computers are specifically for ages 12 through 18. They're set up to know if that's your age. We have a whiteboard for collaboration and just kind of have fun and get creative with. And around the other side of this whiteboard, there's another whiteboard and a group study table. So Michelle, thanks so much for the tour. This is a really a great facility. If someone's interested in coming by, if parents have kids who want uh, them to try this out, uh, what are the hours and how do they make contact with you? Sure. Um, zone 4 actually closes 20 minutes earlier than the rest of the library. So we're open typically 9 to 8.40, Monday through Thursday, um, 9 to 4.40 on Fridays, 9 to 4.40 on Saturdays, and then um, for a short amount of time, Sundays, 1 to 4.40. Have a phone number? We do, uh, 304 Three four three four six four six. Michelle, I appreciate you taking the time and giving us the tour, and uh, thanks to you and Alan for uh, showing us uh, everything there is to see about the Kanawha County Public Library Teen Zone. You're welcome. Thanks, thanks a lot. for visiting. Sometimes library programs come in small packages, and such is the case of the Curiosity Collection at the Summersville Public Library. In 2016, Library Director Sarah Palfrey gave us a guided tour of this small but very curious collection of items. So Sarah, this looks like a great collection of curious items. Why don't you tell us what we all have here? Okay, um, well, we'll start out with our most popular here. The little bits by far have been the runaway hit. Um, and what are they? They are, they're individual circuit modules um, and they're, they're color coded and so each does a different function. One color is input, another color is output. Uh, you connect them together and you can create um, all different kinds of things. The uh, bubble blower is one of the most popular of some kids to um, where it becomes a mechanized, a motorized bubble blower so you can run through your own little bubble fountain. Um, you can create your own car. There's an app that goes with it so that you can then control it wirelessly. Um, there's probably the next popular one, at least according to the middle school kids that we've talked to so far, is the Mischief Maker, where it create, you can use the different modules to create something that knocks things over. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds but like it's, fun. A, it's a great way to experiment with prototyping, learning you know, the cause and effect of how things work, plus the basics of circuitry. Um, and we have four different little bits kits and they all come with different modules so there's a lot of experimenting that can go on there and we have some books in the collection that you can check out with it to give more background um, and then little bits has a fantastic website for educators that includes a lot of lesson plans where you can really uh, you can have fun but you can also make it a, a, a holistic learning experience as well what else do we have um, Somewhere along the same veins, we have squishy circuits, which requires you to make your own Play-Doh. You make an insulating dough and a conducting dough. Mm -hmm. Again, learning how the circuits work. We have some snap circuits too, but those are all checked out at the moment. Um, this has been a surprise hit, the soldering kit. Uh, <laughs> I had a mom tell me that she never in a million years would have bought her 12-year-old daughter a soldering kit, and it has been her favorite thing she's checked out so far. <laughs> so we've got an electrical engineer in the making there, which is fantastic. Well, um, I, let me just point out what I would really love. The would elephant be, on the table. Yeah, the elephant on the table <laughs> yeah. is this great looking telescope. The telescope is, um, we are very excited about it. We are uh, starting to partner with our local astronomy club too, mm -hmm. that we're gonna work on some programming um, to go along with the telescope. Uh, over the next few months to really get uh, conversations going locally between people who love to look at the stars and didn't know there were other people out there in our community that love to do it. So it's, uh, it's been a big conversation piece. Um, some people are a little nervous about taking it home with you, but if you strap it into the, with your seatbelt in the car, <laughs> it's perfectly secure and ready to go. It's quite stable actually. And um, this is a, a model that's used in a lot of libraries across the country. So we have some lower tech things too mm -hmm. for our okay. younger patrons. Um, these are called alpha builds and they're magnetic blocks that you can use to build letters. It's another way to establish, to work on print letters, you know, print awareness as an early literacy skill. 
Um, or you can just build castles or whatever you like to build. We have these and we have some magna tiles and some connects and other building materials as well. Um, for fun, we have a iPhone photography studio. We've, there's a selfie stick in there, a tripod, and some lenses. So you can do wide angle and fisheye and get a little artsy with your, uh, with your iPhone. Um, but we also, again, because we're a rural area, you know, we, th there's some times basic services that are hard to come by. So we added a uh, projector to, we get asked a lot if people can borrow our projector. Um, and so now we have one that we can loan out um, for anything from presentations to doing movies outside. Um, it's been, it's also been pretty popular and a big, a big hit so far. Um, for our uh, inventors, we have the Super Wigglebot kits. And these can be made over again and again into all different kinds of things. Um, you know, putting tools in kids' hands is really important. Um, learning how to use a screwdriver, learning how to put a battery in and take it out. Um, you know, but just being part of what they create is uh, something that we really like to encourage here. We have, we try to make our programs at the Somerville Public Library very participatory, and so now you get to take that home with you too, which is really exciting for us. And what a great collection. I, one thing I'd have to ask you, other libraries may or may not have something like this. Would you recommend other libraries to, uh, they don't have a curiosity collection to try one out? I would recommend uh, figuring out what's gonna work for your library. This is not a new idea. I didn't think of this all by myself. Um, we looked at what a lot of other libraries were doing. There are seed libraries out there and cake pans and American Girl dolls and huge telescope programs. Um, and we looked to see what the need was in our community. And for us, we felt that that was more of the technology and STEM uh, world, that that's what we were lacking access to here. And so there's, um, there's libraries all across the state that check out unique and unusual things. And you know, we're, it's a growing um, facet of, of the library world and one that I hope people will, uh, will investigate and see if it'll work for their space and their community. Sarah, we appreciate you giving us a guided tour of the Curiosity Collection and um, look forward to seeing if other libraries uh, adopt it as well. Wonderful. Thanks a lot. We'll look back at more of libraries today in 2016 right after this. Every child is curious. George, look what I found. Turn their curiosity into a lifelong love of learning. Create a curious reader. This is super bedtime reading. Share a book together today. Visit read.gov. Welcome back to our look back at 2016 on Libraries Today. As we revisit the past year, I can't help but think about how far libraries have come since they started springing up across the state at the turn of the 20th century. Up until then, libraries were very hit and miss and often didn't last long. But all of that started to change when new impressive libraries were built in Huntington and Parkersburg, thanks to funding from the Andrew Carnegie Foundation. These libraries helped establish the groundwork for West Virginia's modern public library system. And in 2016, Libraries Today took a long look at these groundbreaking buildings. We're back in the Parkersburg Wood County Library where we're gonna talk a little bit about what the old Carnegie Library was like. And with me now is the head of technical services for the library, Hazel Stewart. And Hazel, you were actually uh, in the old library and worked there. Mm -hmm. I was actually head of technical services there. Wow. <laughs> and I was hired in uh, late 67 when they were reorganizing mm -hmm. the library board and started in 68 with just me and Dorothy Muse, who was the first library director under the reorganization. Wow. You know, the thing that struck <clears> me <throat> looking at the old library is the architecture. It's a, it's a beautiful building. Yes, yes. On the inside, it's sort of, um, it has glass floors. 
It has a winding staircase to go up to the other levels. And remember, this was back in the days when women wore skirts to work, <laughs> and, and we often um, were a little embarrassed to walk up the stairs with a load of books and <laughs> through the glass did it, ceiling. Did it, have, <laughs> did it have elevators at that point? Um, we had a dummy. Oh, the, wow. Yeah. So we, we walked up and down the winding staircase many, many times shelving books. Wow. <laughs> you know, the, uh, although it's beautiful, uh, a, ter a terrific looking building, it really wasn't made for modern library services. Was no, it? all those old Carnegie buildings look pretty much like that one, I believe, was constructed in 1905. Right. So. As head of technical services, you, and as libraries were changing even then, they've changed, of course, a lot yes. more since then. What kind of problems did you run into <laughs> trying to keep the library uh, modernized? Well, we were just using typewriters and we typed on cards similar to this. And um, I had one helper. She was a co-op student from the high school. And uh, she worked 44 years <laughs> from that building to this building. And she just retired a couple years ago. <laughs> so uh, that's what we had. We just had me and Louise. And um, we just had our typewriters right there. They, they were electronic, yeah. at least. And uh, well, technical, that's how we did it. Technical services libraries have certainly come a long way. <laughs> yes. What yes. are the biggest changes you've seen in all those years? Well, we had to just do it all on our own, no mechanical. Now we just use a scanner, has an ISBN on the bottom mm -hmm. of the book, and the record pops up. We correct it, put a label on it, and send it upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hazel, thanks for spending a little time with us. We appreciate it. It's always great to look back because, as it's been said, you can't know where you're going until you know where you've been. Well, for libraries today, 2016 was a great first year. And now we're looking ahead to 2017, knowing where we've been. In this new year, we'll be back with more programs focusing on the inner workings of the West Virginia Public Library System. The West Virginia Library Commission encourages lifelong learning, individual empowerment, civic engagement, and an enriched quality of life by enhancing library and information services for all West Virginians. For questions or comments regarding topics on this show, please do not hesitate to call us at 1-800-642-9021 or visit us online at www.librarycommission.wv.gov. To keep you updated on library happenings in the state and beyond, the West Virginia Library Commission uses the WVLC website, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube channel, and the Library Lookout newsletter. If you haven't liked us or followed us on social media yet, please do. People think I'm trash, but they're wrong. Today I'm just an aluminum can, but one day I could be a stadium. I'm your host, Stan Howe. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Libraries Today.